The year is 1997, and under the heat of the July sun, the waves of the Atlantic Ocean lap against an oceanographic trawler, the Ocean Wrestler, currently several hundred miles east from the Bermuda Triangle and alone on the horizon. On the weather deck stand four searchers, the sea breeze filling their lungs as they pose for a photo. Behind them, a specially constructed, toughened submersible designed to operate under severe and abnormal conditions, ideal for their purposes. Standing proud in his boots is Greg Blower, the financial backing behind this historic adventure, the sweat congealing on his brow as he suffers the infernal heat. Behind Mr. Blower is Simon Creek, officially Mr. Blower's bodyguard, unofficially the good-for-nothing nephew. Then, the enigmatic Helen Milton with her alert scientific mind, educated in the top colleges in the country. Finally, Professor Caldwell, world-renowned archaeologist, considered to be a fruitcake on the hunt of a lost cause by many in the archaeological community, but in his heart and mind, he knows the many clues and legends he has followed will prove true in the end. The four enter and seal the only exit to the submersible. The tension in the air is thick, and as the professor checks the oxygen pressure levels, the winch is started up, and the submersible is slowly lowered into the deep, murky Atlantic Ocean. The search for a mystery, hidden by the sands of time, has begun. This is the search for Atlantis. Atlantis, a myth known around the world as the city which was sunken by an angry god. Many have searched for it and failed. The lost city has hidden itself well from the prying eyes of the world. As the submersible descends fathom after fathom, Helen watches the instruments act quirkily. It started with a twitch here and there, then some unbelievable readings. Looking at his chronometer, the professor smiles to himself. A quick warning about an abnormal magnetic field puts Helen's mind at rest, but agitates Mr. Blower and confuses Simon. It happened so slowly they almost didn't notice. At first, it was just a little dim and warm. Then, as the sleek yellow submersible continued into the magnetic field, it got brighter and brighter and warmer and warmer. Then Simon noticed a fish, a big fish, a glowing fish. He pointed it out to the professor, who smiled and said it was a prophetic dolphin, reciting a passage written by Christopher Columbus, who spoke of mystic glowing creatures making ethereal noises and guiding them through dangerous waters. It took just a second for the professor to decide the path they should take, and as the dolphin began to swim further into the murkiness, the professor told Helen to use the dolphin as their guide. This drew more than a raised eyebrow from Mr. Blower, who was expecting a well-choreographed scientific mission. He wasn't expecting this. Guiding the submersible through the silence of the seabed, leading them right to the center of the magnetic field, Helen watched the radar as many other curious dolphins began to surround them. Helen smelt the burning electronics of the guidance console and knew they were going to crash. The submersible shook violently as it made contact. Everybody was thrown from their seats onto hard, unforgiving surfaces. In the dim light from outside, Mr. Blower searched for his cigar lighter, constantly muttering insults at the professor. A hull-ripping creak shuddered through the small craft as it finally came to rest. Simon found Mr. Blower in the darkness and helped him to his feet. Meanwhile, the professor was both thanking and praying to the gods. Helen piped up with a status report, her fingers trying the dead controls to no avail. Most of the electrics were gone, and the hull was taking on water. Then the professor suggested she should try the outside lights as they had their own power supply. There it was, the professor's holy grail and Mr. Blower's unique business opportunity, Atlantis. In London, several days later, and in the middle of a snowstorm, a newspaper editor waits.
Kendall, you look exhausted. Have all those football matches you've reported on finally got to you? Not really. It's actually a great job. I see. Well, you remember a couple of weeks back you said you really wanted to be a serious reporter. Well, now, here's your chance. I'm sending you to the Caribbean to find a missing professor. It's a top story, and I know you won't let me down. Well, hmm. Did you say the Caribbean? Yes. It seems Professor Caldwell went there recently, but since then, nobody has heard a thing from him. You may remember that uh, he came into the office a few months back, claiming he was onto the biggest archaeological discovery of this century. Chief, I'm happy doing the sports reviews here in snowy England. The Caribbean sounds great, but this is a job for a more seasoned reporter. Isn't there somebody else you could send? Now, nah, Kendall, I think you're underestimating your talents. I've seen something in you which only the best reporters have. I think it's about time you went on a serious report. You're wasted on the sports section. This assignment will hone your skills. All expenses are paid, and your free use of the company's plane to get you wherever you need to go. You want me to fly in that rust bucket across the Atlantic? Forget it. It's not so bad. Here, take this rum. Have a quick drink before you take off, and you'll be out like a light. You'll find that you'll hold together once in the air. Are you sure you can't get anybody else to do this? I go myself, but I'm working on this ancient languages piece for the next issue. It's fun for an old connoisseur like me, but you wouldn't appreciate it. The Caribbean, hmm. I'm beginning to like the sound of sun-swept beaches and... Bye, Kendall. Go find me that professor. Bye, slave driver. Oh, I mean, chief. Way to the outside world. A quick taxi ride. I'm at the airport. <laughs>